80 seconds. RCO, report range, go for launch. Range, go for launch. LCD Air, you go for launch. Roger. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, engine start, 1, 0, and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets in some way like our own. In recent days, the Kepler spacecraft's discovery of a seemingly Earth-like planet out of the over 2,000 exoplanet candidates is already discovered has caused much excitement here on Earth. The planet, called Kepler-22b, is the first confirmed planet in what is called the habitable zone, where liquid water could exist on a planet's surface. It is roughly Earth-sized and orbits a G-type star like our own Sun. There is still much more to find out about Kepler-22b, such as whether it is primarily rock, gaseous, or liquid, whether liquid water is actually present on its surface, something which the James Webb Space Telescope could tell us, and many are excited about the potential that Kepler-22b may harbor life. This discovery of the Kepler mission is exciting, and the fact that the mission is threatened to be cut in 2012 despite requests to continue this mission until 2016, is insane. However, we would like to draw the attention of our viewers to another point respecting this discovery. Central to the recent discussion around Kepler-22b is the idea of a Goldilocks zone, where scientists are looking for life based on certain conditions which should be suitable for life. For example, not too hot, not too cold. While these kinds of indicators may seem to be a good proxy for what life on Earth can tolerate, it's also the case that work in the field of astrobiology is constantly changing the nature of what we define as habitable or inhabitable. Take Mars, for example. It has changed from habitable to inhabitable numerous times, as our knowledge of Mars changes, and depending upon discoveries of how life thrives in extreme environments on Earth that no one thought possible. Such work has caused some astrobiologists to hypothesize that hydrogen-breathing, acetylene-eating life could exist on Titan. Vladimir Vernadsky has made the point that the conditions of the appearance of life on Earth could have been conditions which we currently consider totally incompatible with any kind of life. In fact, over time, we have seen organisms on Earth at times creating, pursuing, or adapting to new environments seemingly hostile to their own bodies. And that characteristic is still present on Earth. Astrobiology work in such locations as the Atacama Desert, Mono Lake, as well as the Antarctic and Arctic, have served to greatly expand what we view as suitable conditions for life. We have discovered new sicrophiles which can survive in extreme cold, even inside of ice bubbles. Bacteria such as the radiodurons, which can withstand extreme amounts of radiation. And halophiles, which can live in conditions of extremely high salinity. In fact, even great scientists have been proved wrong on some of these accounts. In his Biosphere of 1926, Vladimir Vernadsky insisted that the Dead Sea was in fact dead. No life could exist in its super saline water. Today we know this to be false, as bacteria and microbial fungi have been found there. Also indicative is the discovery from about one year ago of bacteria from Mono Lake in California thought to incorporate arsenic into their molecules in place of the element phosphorus, a staple element for life, whereas arsenic is viewed as a poison to life. Scientists tried out the hypothesis that bacteria could thrive off of arsenates in place of phosphates by taking some halophilic GFAC1 bacteria into a lab and weaning them off of phosphorus, while arsenates were made available. It was claimed that, in fact, the bacteria did incorporate the arsenic into their proteins and fats and even DNA, which was tested using spectroscopy and other methods. While more experimentation is needed, and ongoing a year later, 
The results are still being challenged by some who insist that arsenic could not be a life element. While staunch insistence on that point seems rather premature, given how the conditions which life can exist in have changed so starkly over time, the theory which went into some of these experiments with the arsenates also had a reductionist element to it. Why think to replace phosphorus with arsenic? Well, arsenic lies just below phosphorus on the periodic table, so it's got the same number of electrons in its outer shell to bind with other elements. In terms of expanding the definition of the conditions for life, this idea is not very interesting and remains within a certain conceptual box which ultimately defines life from a lower chemical standpoint. Strict adherence to such theories has not been able to explain what life is or how it arose on Earth, as the case of the failed argument in Alexander Oparin's book, The Origin of Life, demonstrates. Oparin also assumes that life must require the basic organic molecules and as such could never have existed in the harsh conditions outside of the Earth. Oparin stuck Vernadsky in a category of scientists who argued for the eternity of life, which he flatly rejected based on his reductionism. For the moment, we will put aside the provocative question of when and how life became manifest and explore further the question of where it could manifest. The prospect that life and even creative life could exist elsewhere in our universe is surely exciting. And we have good reason to think that life could exist outside of the so-called Goldilocks zone. But the idea that life is a principle which itself transcends any chemistry per se is also likely. Louis Pasteur's work has shown that what we can expect of chemical reactions cannot be expected of life, such as its unique preference for handedness. Vladimir Vernadsky saw this as an indication of the distinction of life from non-life. But those domains, as well as that of human creative life, also clearly coexist and require one another here on Earth. While life on Earth and human life may be unique in form and in activity, and have surely seemed to create a very unique planet, such capabilities may exist elsewhere with a completely different phenotype. As the Johannes Kepler of the Kepler mission showed in his Harmonices Mundi, a musical principle which reflects life and human creativity is at least present at the level of organization of our solar system, and perhaps beyond if manifested differently. Our solar system is a singularity of our galaxy and was produced by a much larger creative process of development which appears to have anticipated and prepared for our harmonic solar system and the specific life we see on Earth. In that case, we should almost be surprised if life and human-like creative life were not much more pervasive phenomena, which we should find inside and outside of the habitable zone. In the 18th century, William Herschel had posited that life could be found in the sun when he said, The sun appears to be nothing else than a very eminent, large, and lucid planet. Its similarity to the other globes of the solar system leads us to suppose that it is most probably inhabited by beings whose organs are adapted to the peculiar circumstances of that vast globe. In writings by Vladimir Vernadsky on the conditions of the appearance of life on Earth, he also favors the conception of life as an eternal trait in the structure of the cosmos. Pasteur also made strong statements to this effect. Let's look at an excerpted writing by Hans Christian Orsted to provoke the imagination about what this could mean for human-like creativity in the universe. Now let us suppose another creature placed in our position on Jupiter. 
differently constituted in every respect, but possessing the same consciousness of natural impressions. Such a being might differ from us in the form and mode of his perception, but so far as the harmonious laws of nature are rightly appreciated, his understanding faculty must agree with these laws, and consequently with our powers of thought. If we are now thoroughly convinced that everything in material existence is produced in accordance with the same laws, we must also allow that the planets have been formed according to the same laws as our Earth. There may be many planets which have not yet attained such a degree of development as our globe, or again, other far higher beings may have been created. But everywhere, the creatures endowed with reason are the productions of nature in the same sense as ourselves. That is, their understanding is bound up with the organs of the body. Therefore, the nature of their understanding cannot be fundamentally different from our own, but must obey the same laws. A similar idea is echoed here with more precision in the more recent writings of Lynn and LaRouche. We may hope that through either the use of alternatives or suitably complementary measures, we might muster the insight required to gain intellectual control over the circumstances which galactic adjustments may require of us. These are types which might often include forms of a living chemistry which are to be located outside the bounds of the manner in which the subjects of life and cognition might have been defined prior to this present time's implicitly threatened galactic crisis for mankind's approaching future. Translated into simpler language, can there be a creature which can be developed into exhibiting a creativity comparable to the human patterns of creativity, and yet lacks an adduced biochemistry consistent with any design among the species identified with the habitation of Earth? Can we find acceptable indications that a species entirely unlike the Earth-bound series of types provides a model of creativity which subsumes a collection of entirely different organizations, which exhibit creativity of a type which is comparable to mankind as a quality of function, but exists in chemistries which are not coherent with any present known biological model? LaRouche also poses the question, earlier raised by Bernard Riemann, as to whether a planet could be our living neighbor, with, in effect, an efficiently virtual mind of its own. Riemann had earlier argued that on Earth, what appears to be development according to a purposeful plan suggests that the Earth possesses a soul and could itself be one living organism, a case made earlier by Gustav Fechner. Riemann implied that life could be found at the center of the Earth, since the nervous system corresponding to the Earth's soul would be protected, and hence would be found inside rather than outside of the Earth. Although he does acknowledge that the temperatures and pressures may make this difficult to conceive of. However, as deep as we've gone today, we haven't not found life. Fossils of microscopic phytoplankton were found in the Cola super deep borehole at a depth of seven and a half miles. If life refuses to be defined by chemistry and physics, and if planetary bodies and solar systems can manifest in tension, as we see in individual living organisms, then what is life? Is it not matter at all, but a specific organization of physical space-time which allows for material expressing a unique kind of activity? If that living matter were not present for eternity, as Vernadsky had hypothesized it could have been, would not the physical space-time allowing for its unique expression have always been present, an eternal trait in the structure of the cosmos, as Vernadsky put it? In conclusion, the mission carried out by the Kepler telescope, as well as our work in the field of astrobiology, should absolutely continue. We should accelerate this research as part of our Arctic imperative, where such fundamentally new breakthroughs can be made. But life only reflects the unlimited potential of man's creativity and our own ability to live in hostile environments, as our first forays into space have demonstrated, among other cases. Our own extraterrestrial imperative to colonize other planets should be accelerated, 
Perhaps we could set our sights on colonizing some of the planets discovered by the Kepler telescope. As LaRouche recently said, mankind's intellectual capacity is not confined to one planet or one solar system. In addition, science should direct its efforts toward gaining an understanding of life and human creative life, which transcends any particular chemical or physical situation. In other words, we could say such a transcendental definition of these principles would, as LaRouche recently wrote, be of the ontological character of metaphor. That is an important frontier question for mankind to address.